Okay. 10, 11, 12, 13.
Hey, good morning, everybody. It's good to see you all here on this Pentecost Sunday. I hope you guys had a blessed week, and what a great way to start the week by coming into the Lord's house, laying all our burdens at his feet, letting him heal us, letting him, you know, talk to us through his, through his word. You know, we're going to go with a call to worship today from Acts 4.12, and it reads, Salvation is found in no one, no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. You know, the Spirit gathers us to worship God and builds us up in faith, hope, and love so that we may go into the world and proclaim the gospel and work for justice and peace. So let's stand, if you're able, and let us worship God together. Let's sing, Oh, for a Thousand Tongues to Sing. On the day of Pentecost, when the Spirit came, the apostles went out and spoke in many different tongues, maybe not a thousand tongues, but certainly a dozen, maybe more, so that all who were gathered that day could hear about the wonders of God in their own language. And even now, gathered around the throne of God, people from every tribe and tongue, people and nation, praise the Lord in their own tongue that he would be glorified. And we have gathered this morning to uh, sing the glories of his name, to sing of his grace. We are called in by the grace of God, and our God is with us. So may the love of God the Father and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Take a moment now to greet one another in the name of the Lord.
For you are my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I seek. You are my all in all. Seeking you as a precious jewel. Lord, to give up, I'd be a fool. You are my all in all. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Rising again, I bless your name. You are my all in all. When I fall down, you pick me up. When I am dry, you fill my cup. You are my all in all. Love endures forever. 
our faith together, we're going to recite the Heidelberg Catechisms, Lord's Day 20, Q&A 53. I'll read the question, and together we'll read the response. And it says, what do you believe concerning the Holy Spirit? And the answer is, first, he is well, as the Father and the Son is eternal God. Second, he has been seen. Amen. Would you pray with me? <coughs> Father God, we come in humility, Lord, confessing who and what we are. Father God, sometimes we are unresponsive, for we are afraid when your spirit spe speaks. Lord, we turn deaf ears, for we fear what you might call us to do, Lord. But Lord, you sent us your spirit, Father, to be a light unto our paths, Lord, to be a guide to us, Father God to intercede for us when we do not know what to pray, Lord. And Father, we all come before you, Lord. We all have something inside of us, Lord. Maybe a struggle, maybe a thought, maybe a deed, Lord. And you say if we confess our sins, Lord, you will, con you will con con forgive us those sins, Lord. And Father, right now we come to you and silently, Lord, just lay at your feet the burdens we have. Word tells us, Lord, that uh, as a father has compassion on his children, so you too have compassion on us, Lord. And you assure us of your pardon, Lord, that if we confess our sins, you throw them as far as the east is to the west, Lord. Lord, we are eternally grateful, Lord. It's something we can never repay you for, Lord. And we thank you, Father, for your forgiveness and your mercy. We thank you and we love you. And it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
giving life to all that God has made. Show your power once again on earth, cause your church to hunger for your ways. Let the fragrance of our prayers arise. Lead us on the road of sacrifice. That in unity the face of Christ may be clear for all the world to see. Lord Jesus, open our hearts and our minds by the power of your Holy Spirit that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, that we may hear with joy what you have to say to us today. Amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning to everyone, and welcome to each and every one of you on this Lord's Day. Jeff and the worship team, thank you guys for some beautiful music this morning. My personal favorite was You Are My All in All. I have uh, been singing that song my entire Christian life, and it was very, very beautiful this morning. Um, I have a few uh, announcements to make here, and I know Pastor Zach does as well, so we'll just go through these. Some of it you'll find in written detail in your bulletin, but... We'll just go and highlight this so that uh, you know what's going on this week and what you can be a part of. Uh, I invite you to come back tonight at 6 p.m. Uh, we have a time of Bible discussion about our church Bible reading plan. The Bible reading plan is called the Soul Food Bible Reading Plan. It has one chapter a day from the Old and New Testament throughout the week. We invite you to be a part of that, whether you come to the evening gatherings or not. So we want you to come back tonight, and I think your bulletin says 5.30, uh, tonight in the council room where we will be looking at the 12th chapter of Job and then we'll have an hour together uh, building each other up in the faith, 6 p.m. in the council room. And I will just say this as an aside for the Bible reading plan. If you can't join us for those Sunday gatherings, another way for you to kind of keep up and to stay in the word is to grab one of these weekly crossword puzzles uh, there are some just outside of the doors uh, into the narthex that you can grab. And there are two questions uh, each day, and those two questions, uh, they go along with the uh, chapter of the day in the Bible reading plan. And so I saw there's a young man out there that's working on it right now, um, and, and I think that's a good thing. Uh, the questions, they kind of drive you to these uh, key parts of the text, and uh, where the, doing the answer won't tell you everything about the chapter, you have to kind of dig a little bit for the answer. And in doing so, surprise, surprise, we got you into the word of God maybe uh, seven times a week. So uh, pick one of those up, really important. And then also, if you'd like to come back and join us tonight, please do so in the council room. On Tuesday, Quilts of Valor. Uh, is meeting. They continue to meet through the summer. You know, some of us, we do our uh, ministry year. We go September through May, and then we stop. But these guys, they never stop making quilts. They never stop reaching out uh, into this local community and beyond in Southern California, um, looking for veterans and active service members to honor um, with a quilt. And so we haven't talked about it in a while up here, but if you do know someone who has never received a quilt before, uh, we can hook you up with the information that you need uh, so that they can come over to Bell One on a Tuesday for a recognition ceremony and be given a quilt of valor. Any questions, you, you can see Pastor Zach or myself, and we'll hook you up with the form. But also uh, the coordinator for the Southern California Quilts of Valor is a member here, Barbara Winkler. Just raise your hand there. Thank you for your work and the ladies that you work with. Um, there are a few others here in the uh, church that are a part of that also. Uh, so, important and uh, special uh, opportunity to be able to thank those who serve for us in the armed forces. PLAN is uh, a group at our church called People Living Alone Now, and the PLAN 
is inviting you for a fun night, if you fit that demographic, um, to Olive Garden in Cerritos on Tuesday, June 14th. Please contact Annie Biggs. Annie, where you at? See that hand there? Uh, contact Annie Biggs with any questions, or if you need a ride to Olive Garden, the best salad, the best salad dressing, the best breadsticks, the best pasta fazool. It'll be a great night um, and important to connect uh, for, that, for that group also. Another group that's going to be meeting during the summer is Coffee Break. Uh, Coffee Break in the Park begins next Thursday, June 16th at 9.30. They meet from 9.30 to 11 under the picnic shelter in Liberty Park in Cerritos. And uh, I know those ladies are looking forward to a great time of discussion and uh, connection with one another out in the fresh air uh, during the summer for ladies' Bible study. Lastly, before I pass on to Pastor Zach, we are very grateful for our sound team and for our AV team. Uh, these are uh, people who work very hard on Sunday mornings, uh, special services and events that we have, weddings and funeral services, and what they do is they um, use their gifts to be able to bring high quality sound and high quality multimedia into our gatherings. These things help us to uh, worship God, to connect with God and one another at gathered services. And so, and live stream services as well. Um, it's time for us to do some training in these areas. It is time, it is high time. That's what my grandparents used to say. It's high time that you clean that room. It's high time that we do some recruiting of new volunteers in Sound and AV. And so as we gather on Pentecost Sunday, uh, we recognize that one of the most beautiful things about how God has gifted the church is that every believer has something to share for the building up of the body. All right, It doesn't matter if you are a new person here. It doesn't matter if you have been in this church for years. Does it matter if you are tech savvy or not? No. Does it matter if you are a professional sound person or not? No, but participate with me, folks. No, it'll matter. Because God, uh, he can and he still will uh, use your willing service and your participation in that ministry will be a blessing to you. It will be a blessing to the church. And so please prayerfully consider this important need uh, for more folks to be busy in the area of sound and AV. There are things going on even today. We have a congregational meeting that Pastor Zach will share more about and also some folks who are in need of prayer. Uh, so I invite Pastor Zach up to share the rest of the news with you. Thank you. Good. I'm still wondering if Pastor Aaron has gifts in the area of sewing quilts. Have you got one of those sewing machines yet? Been working on your needlework? Your iron? I do hang out. Whoa, look at that. I do hang out with them quite a bit. You and, learned a lot. Uh, you, you can pick a lot up. So, wow. yeah, yeah, I'm in. If, they, if I get asked, I'll probably say yes. She's ready to show you how to do it. That would be great. They do good work. It's amazing. I go there once in a while on Tuesday and see all these beautiful colors and shapes, and it's really quite something. So, uh, As Pastor Aaron said, we do have a couple more things. I first want to just welcome you to Pentecost Sunday. It's a beautiful Sunday to be together. We remember the Spirit of God coming down upon His people, and we are people who still live as Pentecost people. The Spirit of God has filled us as well. We're going to talk a lot more about that in a few minutes when we hear God's Word. Um, but first, I got a, a couple more things about things going on. Pastor Aaron mentioned the congregational meeting. It's today, right after the worship service. So if you're a guest with us, you are welcome to be dismissed after the blessing. Uh, but those of you who are members, please stay for a few more minutes. After the postlude, we will uh, convene that meeting. It shouldn't take too long. And you can see that there, or there were, uh, we did have one of those ballots up here, but we'll have ballots at the, uh, at the meeting and we'll sort that all out and you can vote for the, um, the people for new office bearers in the coming year of uh, council. So please stick around for that. You can see also uh, there's some lots of things in the bulletin. Um, not only uh, things to do, but people to pray for. Uh, one other thing, a couple things in the week ahead. 
is uh, next week we will be celebrating communion together. Um, we do that every other month on the second Sunday. We'll be doing that next week Sunday. That will be good as we share that, as we remember what Christ did as he sacrificed for our sins and as he br brings us together as a people around his table. So you can keep that in mind this week as you pray and read scripture. And also next week, uh, we are planning to have a guest uh, sharing about our Christian Reformed Church's um, World Renew Relief work. He is from Africa. He does relief work there. And he'll be sharing for a few minutes during church and then for a longer period of the time, like for an hour, maybe a half hour or so in the council room, more of what World Renew is doing in Africa. So if you're interested in that, find out next week. And you can stay afterwards to learn more. That's next week. Now, um, this past week, we had a, a wonderful service for our uh, dear sister in Christ, Artis Golton, who went to be with the Lord. It was a, she's just a beautiful person, and it was a beautiful service with beautiful music. But we want to continue upholding the Golton family in prayer because she will be missed, and, and they miss her. Um, and you can also see from your bulletin and just know from um, talking to others here that there's quite a few people who are getting tests or um, recovering from illness or just not quite sure what to do next in their, with their health. So please keep them in prayer as well. It's a long list in the bulletin, but uh, just uphold them in prayer. And let's do that right now as we turn to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we remember with great joy and gratitude about the day of Pentecost when you sent your spirit this presence of power in and for your people, your presence in and for your world as the Spirit went out in the power of the gospel in the name of Jesus Christ through your church to the ends of the earth. Lord, you have come into our own hearts as well, and we are grateful for this power, for new life in Christ, for the hope of eternal life forever. You have given us a new heart, made, making us into new people. And for this, Lord, we are grateful. We are grateful for this power, power to redirect our thoughts and the thoughts of others as they hear the gospel to Jesus Christ and then find in him a conviction about all that Jesus said and did. Lord, we thank you for power that brings spiritual gifts to your people, equipping people for ministry, for witness, for proclamation, for works and service of love. Lord, we thank you for the wonderful gift of the Spirit and pray that you would help each one of us to use these gifts well to your glory and for your purpose. Lord, we pray that the gifts of the Spirit would be at work in our church as we look at the ministries that we uh, are continuing to do even through the summer, for people as they gather to read God's Word on Sunday night, for people as they gather to support one another uh, in the plan group, Lord, for people who gather uh, for summer coffee break in the park, may your spirit be there as well. Lord, may your spirit be with those who grieve, those who are struggling with their health, those who are struggling with their, uh, the uncertainty of their lives. Lord, we pray that your spirit would be present in power. And help us, Lord, by your spirit, as your word says, those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. Lord, may we be a people whose minds and hearts are set on the things of the Spirit, on what you are revealing to us in our hearts and in our thoughts. As the Apostle Paul continues saying about spiritual gifts, to each is given a manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Lord, may the, the Spirit at work in each one of us be for the blessing of all, for the common good. We pray, Lord, that you would provide people to help, as uh, Pastor Aaron said, in uh, audio, vi audio visual, and running sound, and things like that. Lord, for any uh, need that we have, we pray that you would provide the people who can do it, people gifted by your Spirit. The Apostle Paul also writes about the good things produced out of the work of the Spirit in us, that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Lord, may these be produced in us by your Spirit. And help us to think about those things too, Lord, as we gather around the table next week, Sunday, thinking about the, the work that you are doing in us, the ways in which we fall short, and our desire for your Spirit to work change. 
God, we do thank you for the faithfulness that you show us, faithfulness in our church, and faithfulness in people like Artis Skolton. God, we ask for your blessing of comfort and peace for her friends and family, even as we also give you thanks for her faith and that she is with you in glory, living in the strength of Jesus Christ. And Lord, we pray for those still struggling in many ways and with their health, for people like George and for Rowan and Barbara, for Carl, for Vera, for Kevin and for Larry, Lord, for many others near and dear to our hearts that you would provide for them and strengthen them by your spirit. God, we also pray for the extension of your kingdom by the power of your spirit, extend it into the world. And now, Lord, may the money that we give in our offerings be a blessing to others. We pray this in Jesus' name. Now our deacons will receive our offerings this morning. Artis was a dear, sweet woman. It was a sad loss for our congregation. You know, but I found out one of her favorite songs was Days of Elijah. So while they're taking the offering, let's... Uh, as a congregation, let's sing Days of Elijah in, in remembrance of, of Artis. These are the days of Elijah Declaring the word of the Lord And these are the days of your servant Moses Righteousness being restored And though these are days of great trials Of famine and darkness and sword Still we are the voice in the desert Crying prepare ye the way Lord, behold, he comes, riding on the clouds, shining like the sun, at the trumpet call, lift your voice, it's the year of Jubilee, and out of Zion's hill, salvation comes. And these are the days. The dry bones becoming as flesh And these are the days of your servant David Rebuilding a temple of praise And these are the days of the harvest The fields are as wide in the world And we are the laborers in your vineyards Declaring the word of Lord, behold, he comes, riding on the clouds, shining like the sun, let the trumpet call, lift your voice, it's a year of jubilee, and out of Zion's hill, salvation comes. There's no God like Jehovah. 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 Behold, He comes, riding on the clouds, shining like the sun. At the trumpet call, lift your voice. It's the year of Jubilee, and out of Zion's hill, salvation comes. Lift your voice. It's the year of Jubilee, and out of Zion's hill.
I smile to think of an uh, artist right now singing that song, Up in Glory, you know, jumping around. I'd like to see that someday. This morning, we are uh, going to finish this series. It's Pentecost, and we're kind of ending here on Pentecost in these first few chapters of the book of Acts. You've kind of heard the story already, starting in chapter 1, and then especially in chapter 2, hearing about the Spirit's arrival on the day of Pentecost. We're going to keep the Pentecost Spirit going. One more Sunday, one more message uh, in chapter 3. Chapter 3 is quite a bit like chapter 2, a similar kind of setup where there's something amazing that happens that God did, and then a crowd gathers, and then Peter tells everybody what it means. That's what happened in chapter 2, when the Spirit came, and they spoke in all those tongues, and the crowd gathered and said, what does this mean? And Peter preaches a long sermon. That's kind of what happens here, too. There's a healing. The man jumps around, gathers a crowd, and then Peter tells everybody, what it means. So that's kind of the dynamic here. We're going to hear this word in just a moment. Let's pray as we come to God's word. Our Heavenly Father, we are grateful for this word. This word, uh, a sermon, a miracle and a sermon from Peter that helps us to understand what Pentecost means, what the Spirit's arrival means, what Jesus Christ means. Lord, we pray that you would help us to treasure this testimony from an eyewitness to Jesus Christ's life, death, resurrection, and ascension. To treasure it and then also be Pentecost people who also bear witness in our own lives and with our voices, proclaiming what Christ has done. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, chapter 3 says, One day Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at 3 in the afternoon. Now, a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John. And then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave him them his attention, expecting to get something from them. And then Peter said, silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk, and he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. While the man held on to Peter and John, all the people were astonished and came running to them in the place called Solomon's Colonnade. When Peter saw this, he said to them, Fellow Israelites, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness we had made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified this, his servant Jesus. You handed him over to be killed. You disowned him before Pilate, though he had decided to let him go. You disowned the Holy and Righteous One and asked that a murderer be released to you, you killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. We are witnesses of this. By faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has completely healed him, as you can all see. Now, fellow Israelites, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your leader. But this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, saying that his Messiah would suffer. Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord, and that he may send the Messiah who has been appointed for you, even Jesus. Heaven must receive him until the time comes for God to restore everything, as he promised long ago through his holy prophets. 
So Moses said, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You must listen to everything he tells you. Anyone who does not listen to him will be completely cut off from the people. Indeed, beginning with Samuel, all the prophets who have spoken have foretold these days, and you are heirs of the prophets and of the covenant God made with your fathers. He said to Abraham, through your offspring, all peoples on earth will be blessed. And God raised up his servant. He sent him first to you to bless you by turning each of you from your wicked ways. This is God's word for us this morning. And this story is quite memorable, especially for that snappy line from Peter about having something better than silver or gold, which ends up attracting a large crowd about to, so that they can hear about someone who is far better than silver or gold. Now, I imagine very hypothetically here that Peter could have attracted a crowd with silver and gold as well, right? I mean, if you start throwing money around, people will pay attention and come running for that too. Like on that show, the Oprah show, and she starts giving stuff away. She's like, you get a car, and you get a car, and you get a car, or money, throwing $100 bills around, and you get 100 and you get 100 and you get 100 That would attract a crowd, right? You could make an internet meme out of that. It would go viral and get lots of likes. That's how it works in our world today to attract attention. And Peter is a witness. He is a witness who it desires people to give him attention, but not because of anything that he did, right? Peter is determined to redirect people's attention. That's true that this man's healing brought a lot of attention. But Peter's purpose is not to gather attention for himself, not to gather attention for anything like silver or gold, not to gather attention even to this man who was healed, but instead to redirect attention, to redirect attention on Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And it is in that name, Jesus' name, that all this has been done. And that's a name that he wants everybody to know about. So Peter is a witness. That means that he wants others to know and hear about someone else. That someone else is Jesus. That's his name. And so this uh, passage is a nice, uh, it's a nice um, example for us of testimony. Peter giving testimony that we too need to hear. We need to listen in on what Peter has said in order to find encouragement and conviction and truth for ourselves. This is precious eyewitness testimony from somebody who was with Jesus. So that's one thing we need to do with this passage, is to hear it, to hear the testimony and be convicted about it. This is important witness for us to listen to deep in our hearts. But Peter also shows us a nice example of how to proclaim what to do, how to be engaged with those who want to hear, who are hungry, who have gathered attention to something that God did. So we can learn from Peter's example, even as we hear what he has to say. That's what we're going to think about this morning. Now, it is true that many people would easily imagine that if they had more gold and silver, that would solve most of their problems. The point of the gospel, the point of the book of Acts, the point of this story is that Jesus is a Savior who solves problems that we may not even have realized that we had, right? Now, some of the problems that people have are pretty obvious. The man who was healed after being disabled for his whole life knew he had a problem. And Peter's uh, words and the power of Jesus Christ, the presence of the Spirit, solves that man's problem. And he got up and he walked away. And he was so happy about it. That problem is pretty obvious. But some of the problems aren't so obvious. Like later in Peter's speech, he says, Now I know you acted in ignorance. People didn't even know what they did wrong. It's true. Sin, one of the effects of sin is to blind us to the things that are sin. We don't even know what we don't know. Peter knows that. Peter has new eyes to see the world in front of him. Peter has a new understanding in his mind about what's true in Jesus Christ. Peter has become a new person with a new spirit, the Holy Spirit, who has been poured out. 
And so he is eager to reveal this to other people. He starts his speech. He says, look, Israel, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us? Peter's not surprised by this sort of thing anymore because Peter has come to know Jesus Christ and all that Jesus can do. So what surprises other people doesn't surprise Peter, like this man, lame from birth, dancing and jumping and walking and praising the Lord. And Pentecost is like the culmination of the story for Peter. I mean, Peter's been on quite a journey, right? I mean, Peter knew Jesus personally right at the beginning of that ministry that Jesus did. He had seen Jesus in action, heard him speak, been corrected by Jesus quite a few times. Peter had watched the way that Jesus died and then been there on Easter to see the empty tomb. He met Jesus in the flesh after the resurrection, and then he saw him ascend to heaven. But that wasn't, he wasn't done yet. In fact, it was almost like that was just the beginning, right, for Peter. Because after Jesus left, he poured out his spirit, and now Peter's got a mission. He, is a, he was always a man of boldness, but he didn't always understand what he was doing. When you read the Gospels, that comes through pretty strong, right? Peter's bold, but Peter's a little confused sometimes. Now it's different. Peter's still bold, but he's got a new spirit. He's become a new person, born again in Christ. And, and Peter has a purpose, proclaiming Christ as an eyewitness. Peter can see things that the other people can't see. And that's what happens when we know all about Christ. That's what happens when we receive the power of the Spirit in our lives. It's transformative. And it doesn't just transform us on the inside. It transforms the way that we engage with other people as well. He, Peter is so engaging here in the book of Acts. Helping people to, to hear, to see, to experience the power of Christ through the work of the Spirit. Now, there is a uniqueness about Peter. It's true. Peter's a little different from us because while we are all called to be witnesses for Christ, Peter was an eyewitness. We're not eyewitnesses, right? But Peter was. We stand on that foundation of his eyewitness as we, too, offer our witness to Christ. And it's true that all of us, Peter included, are called to be disciples. But J Peter had an additional calling as an apostle. And we're not called to be apostles, but we're all called to be disciples. And so there's a uniqueness about Peter, but there's also an incredible sense of, of unity, having the same thing, the same gospel message, the same hope of salvation, the same spirit at work in him is in us, out for the world. So this is transformative. We see it transforming Peter, transforms us too. This is one of the important things about Pentecost. The Spirit poured out for transformation. Now, the thing that Peter does here in this message, as I just mentioned a few minutes ago, is to continually redirect people to Jesus Christ. That's a key point in this passage, that, that one of the key things that Peter says to this disabled man, he makes this point later in his sermon, is that this happened in the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus is essential to everything that happens in this story, in the healing and in a sermon. Without the name of Jesus, there would be nothing to see and nothing would happen. That is the essential dynamic in this story, is that Jesus is present. And it's the name that communicates the presence of the person. I mean, there's nothing special about, like, the name as an incantation or some kind of magic formula not like that. Rather, the name speaks to the authority of the person present in the situation. Faith in the name is trust in the person present. Faith in the name is trust in the person who has power. And the person with the power, the presence, and the authority to heal is the person of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And Peter makes it abundantly clear in this passage that it's God who is the main actor in this story. That's what the redirection is all about throughout this story. God is the actor. Peter is the witness. Peter makes it very clear that 
This all happened on a higher authority than him. In fact, there's a lot of titles for Jesus in this passage. If you read through the sermon, you can start adding them up. That Jesus is the Holy One, the Righteous One. Jesus is the author of life. Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the prophet, greater and like, but greater than Moses, the one that Moses pointed towards, and that everything foretold in the prophets, beginning with Samuel, points towards Jesus. The name of Jesus gathers all of that stuff up, all the titles, so that we honor the greatness of Jesus Christ. So, like I said, we are people here today who need to hear this eyewitness testimony, this sermon from Peter, because this is, this is a treasure. I mean, think about it. This is just a few days after Jesus ascended, a few days after the Spirit had come. Now Peter is proclaiming in a sermon what it means. He was there. And so these words of testimony from Peter ought to be precious to us as eyewitness testimony about our Savior, Jesus Christ, just a few days after his ascension and the pouring out of the Spirit. And so that's something I think that, that we need to hear with open ears and soft hearts, with conviction, to meditate on these words, and to, to think them through. How do, we, how do we hear this? What do we understand? This is precious. This is a treasure. So take that just today as you meditate on these words further. The precious testimony of an eyewitness about Jesus Christ just a few days after he ascended. That's one of the wonderful things about the book of Acts. You get all that eyewitness testimony to treasure it. There's also this sense in which Peter has showed us how to be a witness. And one of the key points is witnesses continually redirect the attention of others onto Jesus Christ. And, and that's something I think all of us can do. You know, when something important happens in your life, to reflect on the way Jesus was present. When others might ask you about it, you have the opportunity to direct their attention to Jesus. This is a worthwhile way to think about being a witness. Witnesses redirect attention to Jesus. That's what Peter does, and that's what you can do. That's what we do as witnesses. Now, Peter does more than that. There's lots of things to learn about being a witness here. There's a sense in this passage, too, in which Peter doesn't just engage with words of witness. He engages in a pretty uh, wide-ranging way. So let's look at that. Like, you see how in verse 3, for example, it says that the man spoke to Peter and John, and then Peter said, he replied back. So there's this interaction with words. Peter is listening with his ears, and the man who he speaks to also hears what Peter has to say. Of course, that's what witnesses do. They talk. But there's more, right? Because it says that Peter looked at this man, verse 4, and also that Peter instructed the man, look at us. So there is serious eye contact between the man who's disabled and Peter and John, who are there. And then after that, there's more. Because when Peter says, in the name of Jesus, the words of healing, he doesn't just stand back and see if it works, right? He reaches out and takes the man by the hand and pulls him up. And that's when his legs, his feet are healed, and he stands up on his on his own strength, after being pulled to his feet by Peter. So there's this multi-sensual, or, you know, he's engaged in more than one sense, the ears, the eyes, the touch, reaching out in this interaction as he bears witness and brings the power of Jesus into this man's situation. Now, th now this, is, this shouldn't be too surprising to us, but it is wonderful to see to think about how witnesses do this with their ears, with their eyes, with their hands to reach out and touch. Because this is the way Jesus had done this too, right? Peter and John have been trained by Jesus. 
And when Jesus went around, Peter, Jesus saw people, right? Jesus always saw the people in the back who were a little nervous about being there. Jesus always saw the people who were struggling and needed a hand. Peter, Jesus always saw those who were in need. They were valuable to him. They mattered to him. He made sure to look for them. Jesus' eyes were always on those in need as he went around from place to place. And so Peter and John have been trained in the same way and now empowered by the Spirit. They've been transformed. They, and they do this. They live as Jesus did, seeing the people in need as people of, of worth and value, important to God. And they, they come there to them, right? And they also listen. They're able to hear the cry of the needs of the people around them. That's what Jesus always did. Jesus could hear. He listened. Sometimes Jesus would be walking along, and there'd be a huge crowd. And then somebody off on the side of the road would be crying out to Jesus, Jesus, have mercy on me. I'm a sinner. And Jesus always heard that voice, and he'd stop. He'd say, he want to talk to that person, right? Jesus heard the cry. Peter and John hear the voice of the man in need and give him more than he ever expected. And of course, Peter and John had been trained by Jesus to reach out and touch those who were considered outside the people, outside of what was considered clean in their religion, people who were outside of the rituals and who could kind of like, they felt, contaminate. That never stopped Jesus, right? Jesus was always reaching out to give a hand and touch to those who were considered unclean and, and not worthy and, and who were going to, in a sense, contaminate. And, of course, the power never came on Jesus of contamination. Instead, it worked the other way around, right? The power always went from Jesus out to bring healing and wholeness. And so Peter and John had been trained that same way, to reach out with a hand, because that's transformative too. And what's wonderful about this story is that they don't just look and listen and reach with the hand. They also insist that this guy interact with them as they did these things. They, they listened, he spoke. They looked and they said, you look at us too. They reached out and he pulled him up and then he starts moving. There's this interactive sense of, of being a witness to Christ so that people don't just experience it one way but they experience this interaction with all their senses as God brings wholeness to their lives. It's kind of beautiful that way. And that's something for us to think about, too, as witnesses. This is how we've experienced the help of God, and so this is how we share the love of God with our eyes to see, with our ears to hear, with our hands to reach, just like Jesus did. That's something beautiful in this passage. Now, there's a... Uh, there's more, right? There's a transition in the passage because at the beginning of the passage, the Peter and John get the man's attention. They get his attention. He looks right at him. They say that line about silver and gold and then had bring healing into his life. They got his attention. That's the first part of the passage. And then in the second part of the passage, there's more attention, but this time the attention is from the whole crowd because they see this man who's been healed hanging on to Peter and John, but also like jumping around and happy and praising God and giving like his whole response as he jumps. He gets everybody's attention. I mean, he had like jumping in the tabernacle or the temple, right? He's like happy. And, and they, they're like, wasn't that the guy who used to sit in that spot, and he was stuck there. I mean, it was kind of like hospital, and he couldn't move. He needed somebody to bring him there. He needed to beg for money there. He couldn't move from his spot because there was something wrong with his legs. He was that guy in that spot. Sometimes, you know, that's familiar to us here in Bellflower because we see people like that too, right? Sometimes there's homeless people who have a spot, and you get to know them a little bit maybe, and you regularly see them in their spot. 
And, and it's like they're, sometimes it's like they're stuck because they're disabled or something. And they really can't move. And I think some of us, uh, some of you have had this experience too where you're sort of stuck in the hospital. People who are in the hospital often feel very stuck, right? I know when I have visited people at the hospital, they feel this way. They're like, oh, pastor, I can't wait to go home. There's all of this noise, these things that beep. There's nurses coming in and out. I can't get any sleep. And they feel stuck. They're like, they're at the hospital. They cannot wait to get out. In fact, a co- like a week ago, I got a message from Kevin Wigbaldi because it was the day he got to go home. He'd been in the hospital for a week, and he was so happy. He said, Pastor, today I get to go home. And we kind of celebrated that across some text messages because he was so happy to go home. And it's like this man was in the hospital, and this is the day when he gets to go home. Except it's not just that, like, he got enough to go home, but he's still feeling kind of like, I got a long recovery here. It's more like total transformation, complete healing, and he gets to, 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 to do things he had never done before, jumping around and dancing there in the temple. Now, this, of course, draws a huge crowd, right? They had seen this guy and thought, man, is this the same person? It seems like it. What's he doing jumping around and praising God? That's, that's, that's surprising. So that gives Peter the opportunity to speak. And what Peter does is turn it back on the people. And it's like he says, as sort of speak, you listening to me here to this sermon are in the hospital, just like this guy was in the hospital. He has now been healed. Let me tell you how to be healed. He turns it back around, right? It's just sort of a dyna- dynamic in this passage because you see as the sermon begins, he gives them a pretty hefty, pretty weighty diagnosis. I mean, this is a diagnosis that there's trouble written all over it. You, you, and you. This is what went wrong. I mean, sometimes we uh, sing that song around Good Friday that goes like, Were you there when they crucified my Lord? It's sort of this gentle song for contemplation. And Peter does that, except he says it super direct, right? Like, you were there, and you too. You, you turned him over. You disowned him. You killed him. You are guilty. And some of those people might have been in the crowd when they said, crucify him. Peter lays it out pretty thick here, right? This is the diagnosis. Why are you guilty? You are sinners. You turned Jesus over. You had him killed. He was righteous. But you rejected him. This is the diagnosis. You have a fatal disease. It's sin and guilt. Peter makes no bones about it, right? You. But Peter doesn't just leave it there. He also tells them about the treatment. He tells them about Jesus. He says, you know, you handed him over, but it was all in God's plan all foretold by the prophets, by Moses, and to Abraham, and in these covenants, and all the prophets pointed this way, that the Messiah had to die, and that through him your sins would be wiped away. That's the miracle. That you were so guilty, you had a terminal illness and guilt, but you needed a miracle, and that's what you got. You got Jesus who worked the miracle. Thanks be to God. That's the treatment. That's the miracle. And then there's a recovery plan. He tells him about the recovery plan to repent from your sins and listen to Jesus. And you will experience times of refreshment. It's kind of a curious phrase, isn't it? It can also mean relief, relief or refreshment. And I think, uh, I'm just kind of guessing here, but my hunch is that the people listening to this were like, oh man, we condemn that guy to be killed on the cross, which is like torture, and now he's back? That's not good for us, right? I mean, what if you did that to somebody, and now he's back? What's he going to do to you? He's like, is he out for vengeance? You wonder about that. And Peter says, no, he's not out for revenge. He is here for refreshment. He is not here for retribution. He is here for relief. You walk in grace for the forgiveness of sins. 
And so he tells the people how bad it is. He tells the people how good Jesus is, the gospel. And then he tells the people what hope they have and how to respond. This is the sermon that Peter preaches. That's the gospel, right? Peter bears witness to Jesus Christ. We talk about sin. We talk about forgiveness in Jesus Christ. And we talk about how to respond in a new life with the hope we have summarizing the gospel. Now, this uh, that's what he tells them. And uh, he tells them this because of what happened at a place called the Beautiful Gate. And this is what I want to finish with. This is this lovely detail twice in this, ser- uh, in this passage, in the sermon Peter preaches, about the Beautiful Gate. That's a curious name for a gate, right? Apparently this gate was on the eastern side of the temple complex, which was huge. That was this disabled man's spot. And probably a lot of other people begged there as well. And so you would go through the be- beautiful gate to do the very best beautiful thing, which is to worship God and be in the presence of his people and, and opening your heart and, and coming near to the Holy One. But to do all those good things, you had to pass by a lot of human suffering on the way into the temple. These people who begged, because they had no other way to support themselves there outside a gate like this one. So it might not seem all that beautiful to many people because you had to pass through this gate of human suffering on your way into the temple. But of course, in this miracle, it's all turned around. There's an irony here, right? There was an irony in that there was suffering at the beautiful gate. But now it's turned backwards because now there is this beautiful healing at the beautiful gate. And everybody can celebrate the power of God at work. Now, I think this is quite relevant for us because we see this. I mean, we probably pass by struggling people on our way to church this morning. That's not at all unusual in our city. And we have to think about the fact that on the way to the place of prayer, On the way to be faithful to God in worship, Peter and John did not pass around human suffering, but rather they went through it and then went into the place of worship with gladness, with salvation, with this man rejoicing because the power of God was at work in him. So let's think about that as people who are witnesses. We're not going to heal people in the way that Peter did, but certainly we can look We can listen. We can reach out with the hand to bear witness to Jesus Christ so that we can show how Jesus fulfilled everything God was doing, how Jesus in the present is resurrected and reigns at God's right hand and how in the future he is coming again, as Peter says, to restore all things. That's the good news of the gospel that Peter proclaims. That's the good news we take into our hearts and into our week. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this word, this treasure, this precious message from Peter of eyewitness testimony about your spirit, about Jesus Christ, about the fulfillment of your word. Lord, may we take it to heart and be convicted about it ourselves and treasure the story about Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray, too, that you would help us, having this story in our hearts, to be people who proclaim it, who see the needs of the people around us, who hear the cry of those in need, and and as people who reach up, reach down with a hand to pull people up and, and to tell them that this is all possible through the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Lord, may that name be transformative in your world as we act as your witnesses in it. Empower us by your spirit. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you please stand? You called me from the grave by name. You called me out of all my shame. 
I see the old has passed away, the new has come. Now I have resurrection power, living on the inside, Jesus. You have given us freedom, no longer bound by sin and darkness. Living in the light of your goodness, you have given us freedom. I'm You have given us freedom, no longer bound by sin and darkness, living in the light of your goodness, you have given us freedom. Freedom, you have given us freedom, you have given us freedom. My chains are gone. Freedom, you have given us freedom. You have given us freedom. Hallelujah. Freedom, you have given us freedom. You have given us freedom. My chains are gone. Freedom, you have given us freedom. You have given us freedom. Hallelujah. Now I have resurrection power. Living on the inside, no longer bound by sin and darkness. Living in the light of your goodness, you have given us freedom. Go into this week with the Holy Spirit and in the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. Go in the grace and in the knowledge of God, who is our Father, of Jesus Christ, our Lord, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Spirit of the living God, fall Remember, we have a congregational meeting, so please come back. All others, you are dismissed. These are the days of Elijah. Declaring the word of the Lord, and these are the days.